Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to host you one more time, one more evening through a valuable conversation for all of us. Tonight, the Institute is building amazing bridges between all of us and the science behind quantum information theory. So tonight we are going to talk about user interfaces for the complexity nature. Our quantum information theory that has given us a new and interesting twist on the old problem of quantum gravity, the universe as a computation. What can we know and what should we know about this? As the computation proceeds, reality unfolds. Information theory allows us to study the behavior of system without committing to a particular story about it. For example, the story of space-time um, is not something we should commit to, or maybe not. We can go beyond that point where the old story is no longer useful. Information theory comes with a new style of stories about how the world works, stories of complexity and emergency. This is not unique to physics. The same shift has happened in neuroscience, where the predictive coding framework for the brain have turned our thoughts and emotion into emergent construct, tools of our brain that uses to move our body. They are just like space-time and physics. This talk explores recent development in both physics and neuroscience to identify some key new ideas like that will likely shape our future stories of this world. So our amazing host tonight and who will be with us is uh, Putini Marco Polo, which is, she's the CEO of Empathic Technologies, the founding faculty of Perimeter Institute of Theoretical Physics. Putini, welcome on board. She's, um, let me introduce her to the platform. She is a Greek theoretical physicist who's interested in fund foundation mathematics and quantum mechanics. She's a founder and faculty at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Canada, one of the premier institutes on frontier of theoretical physics. She's as well a visiting professor at MIT um, and the Santa Fe Institute of Complexity System. Um, she's a fellow at the, she's a Humboldt fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in Berlin. Her physics research focuses on quantum gravity and quantum cosmology for the information theory. And also she's focusing her research in complex system and network uh, from a network perspective. She pioneered uh, on um, introducing influential ideas on emergence of space-time that have been covered in several popular science books and major media outlets. Uh, Futini Marco Polo is uh, keenly interested uh, in the links between fundamental science and our experience of reality. She has a double master in design and engineering from Royal College of Arts and Imperial College. And she was the CEO of uh, Empathic Technologies, a pioneering wearable company that applied cutting edge breakthroughs in the neuroscience of emotion to, product, uh, to produce products effective uh, for a range of mental health issues. Um, she's continuing to weave threads connecting science and real life. She's now the director of Complex Real, which is an advising stakeholder on the future landscape of emotions and is writing a book on neurodiversity and ADHD as a lens to our experience of reality. Fotini, welcome on board. We cannot wait to hear all of the insights that you have for us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be giving this particular talk. I am going to try to bring together um, different threads that I've followed over, I guess, the last two decades. And ultimately, they really go down to what is it that we, not only we know about the world, but what is it that we believe is real about the world, how that comes to be. And in the process, what I find fascinating is that you see how we are in 
on the cusp of really doing science and understanding reality in a different way because um, many things are changing in our knowledge and actually reflecting the wider societal changes. So I'm going to try to track this in the most fundamental of um, disciplines, both in physics and, um, and also in neuroscience. I am going to share my slides. Everything okay? Everything is perfect. The floor is yours. We can see it perfectly. All right. So let's start with quantum gravity. Uh, it's classic, the hardest problem, the fundamental problem in fundamental physics. Uh, it comes from the difficulty in putting together the two most uh, fundamental theories that we have of understanding the world at the most basic level, which is quantum theory and general relativity. And we can actually get to the point of where the problem is pretty fast. So quantum theory, we all know that it involves a cat that is both dead and alive. So the, the point in quantum theory is that matter uh, at the microscopic level can both be somewhere and not be somewhere at the same time. And so you can set up this experiment where if um, uh, uh, an electron fires in a certain way, then the cat dies. If it doesn't, then the cat doesn't die. But actually what happens is that it is in a state of quantum superposition. And so you end up with uh, the electron being in your detector and not being in your detector. And therefore the cat is both dead and alive. And the whole point here is the plus sign that it is in both states, in the dead and the alive state. We'll come back to that. I'm sure you've seen this before. It gets a lot more fun when you bring in um, general relativity, which is uh, how gravity works, but it's also the theory of space-time. And again, generally it is most, most basic. It says that space-time and matter are deeply interconnected. So what space-time does is tell matter how to move. And at the same time, matter tells space-time how to curve. So this is all super well tested, both quantum theory and general relativity from particle accelerators to cosmology all of these things are correct. Okay, so these two things are correct, except there's a little problem that they apply at different regimes. So quantum theory applies at a very small, general relativity applies at large scale, but then there are places like the inside of a black hole or the beginning of the universe where you actually need both because the gravitational fields are so high that the quantum effects really matter. So, it quickly starts going weird when you start to put them together. So let's just go back to general relativity because you think of it as geometry and there's space-time geometry, but actually space-time is made out of things that happen. I mean, what is time is a sequence of flow of events of things that happen. And those things are super physical. So like right now, the, what I just told you is in your past. Um, we are constructing time here. So things happen in your past and how do they become past? Through a physical process. So um, the, from, um, we're now doing it all, all on Zoom. So the photons from your laptop hit your retina while you're watching this and the sound from it um, reaches your eyes. And it is those physical interactions, there are actually collisions going on there that create the past of what I just told you. Now, we could set it up so that this talk is happening, but it is not in your past. And I'm not talking about like having a problem with your internet connection. Um, I'm a theoretical physicist, and so I can um, do thought experiments. And so let's imagine that I put a 
black hole, a small one, probably in an appropriate position on the other side of your living room or wherever you are right now, so that all the photons from your laptop get sucked in by the black hole instead of hitting it. So this talk is happening, the laptop is there, it is doing what it's doing, but it is not registering your past. So now your history is different. And in theory, general relativity says that this is possible. So what, what I just did is that I curved the space time to change really um, the flow of information towards you. And so uh, your history changes as a result. Now, tricky thing is if I bring quantum theory in this, then I have to say that the, the matter that created your past has quantum effects. So once you take that into account, then you have to say, okay, well, there should really be a quantum superposition of the black hole sucking the talk out of your experience and not doing that. So you could be, if we were doing the full blown theory of putting together quantum theory and general relativity as it is in the textbooks, what it really concludes is that you are sitting there watching a talk or, sorry, and not doing that at the same time. And that really makes no sense. It's, this is the part where I don't like Zoom talks because I can't really see quite what you look like and whether that was all clear, but we can always come back to it at the end at the questions. So let's assume that we have agreed at this point that um, we have a bit of a problem that we have two theories that work really well when you put them together, they make no sense. This has something to do with how um, space and time are in some sense fundamentally physical, made out of uh, stuff that happens and stuff is physical. Okay, so this has been around for a long time. Um, there are lots of theories at this point, trying to resolve this. There's string theory, there's loop quantum gravity, there is causal dynamical triangulation, there's a whole load of them. Uh, I've worked in quite a few of them. They, um, well, I guess it's still unsolved. <laughs> We're still here talking about it as a problem. And as a physicist, uh, sometimes you kind of remember what happened what people said in the old days. People have been here before in other situations, like um, when um, the kinetic theory was being developed in thermodynamics and there were questions of, uh, do atoms really exist, for example? And what people did is make super complicated theories of what atoms were like. So they could be vortices or they could be all sorts of uh, detailed stuff. But that didn't answer the, the question of do they exist or not. In fact, what answered it in the end was Brownian motion, which is um, the, just the very basic fact that uh, if, if nature is atomic, then you have statistical fluctuations. In similar terms, what this, um, this classic physicist attitude is, is okay, let's make this simple. And let's make a model. And that's what you always do as a physicist. Um, the classic one, let's assume we have a spherical cow uniformly filled with milk. Let's try to just simplify everything, okay? Instead of having the geometry of space-time smooth black holes and so on, how simple could we possibly make this? And so then you ask the question, okay, so what is the simplest model of locality? What is the simple model really of space? What is space? 
and space is a fundamental level, it cannot be um, a notion of here and there because that presupposes space, but locality is something that you could um, talk about without having space already. We are trying to make the, the thing that generates space, the atoms of space, if you like, but they're not really that. It's just, you have stuff. So let's uh, say you have two things, two dots. So there are two possibilities. One is that they will talk to each other, they will interact. The other is that they won't. And so let's say that if they do interact, we call them local and we put a link between them. And if they don't, we say that they're not local and we don't put a link. And that's where the quantum information, the information of paradigm comes in because when you have a link, it's like you have a one. And when you don't have a link, it's like you have a zero. And that starts making things actually interesting rather quickly. So if you have, um, say, a universe of 10 things, then th you could have all of them interacting with each other, in which case you have a world of super highly connected, uh, everybody's local to everybody else, or they're more spread out. And let's remember, it is always like that, that everything is quantum mechanical. So um, two things are connected and they're not connected. So all the models that we play with here are quantum mechanical. Now, even though that is super simple, you can actually get really interesting stuff out of it. So on the very left, it's this um, model of a black hole, actually. So how does light or any kind of information move around in this graph? You have to jump around from one thing to another. Two things have to be connected for the information to carry through them. So you can model a black hole by a region, a collection of thingies in the universe that are all connected to each other. And now let's see what would happen. So you move on the outside of this highly connected region. You kind of move one step at a time, move forward. Then you hit the connected region. Then you actually are gonna be bouncing around for a very long time before you're gonna find your way out. Because at any given node on the surface of the highly connected region, there are many more edges connecting to other nodes than edges going out. So actually this is a trapped surface. You go in, you get stuck with a very small chance of coming out, which by the way, uh, has a behavior very similar to Hawking radiation, which is what happens with an evaporating black hole. So that, that's really cool because you can start modeling in very simple ways, it's like standard uh, methods that you can use from condensed matter physics, um, a world where the atoms, atoms in quotes, is simply whether things are connected or not. And that then leads to the notion of geometrogenesis, so that geometry is really something that emerges in, um, some regimes. So you could think of the early universe as being super hot, everybody is connected to everybody else. And what happens is as the universe cools down, this highly connected graph unfolds into the super symmetric, regular um, world that we live in, not unlike the way that um, you get a crystal structure coming out in an ice cube from what could also be in a liquid phase. So you really have a phase transition that goes from a regime where there is no reasonable notion of space when everything is connected to everything else you would never imagine of using space because there is no sensible here or there. When it unfolds and an order emerges, then uh, 
geometric description becomes appropriate, useful. So what you end up doing here, um, and obviously I'm not going through the details, but it works surprisingly well, is that you get a description of the effective geometry of these graphs that is very close to what general relativity um, has. And in a way with hindsight is not so surprising because what general relativity says is that space-time tells matter how to move and matter tells space-time how to curve. And in this case, this is automatic because actually matter and geometry are just different descriptions of the same thing. You don't have two different things that you're trying to bring together, space-time and matter that moves on it, but every time it moves, it changes the space-time. You just have matter, your stuff, your nodes, and then the way that it interacts is really what it defines space. So in this case, space is emergent, is an order of relationships. And the dynamical structure of space-time that you see in general relativity is baked in. And also since your system is fundamentally quantum, you have uh, space come, space-time geometry coming out of a quantum system. So that is uh, surprisingly simple way to start uh, modeling how it may be that there is a quantum theory of gravity that is the fundamental one where the um, classical description of general relativity being an emergent one uh, space-time if you like, is a kind of bookkeeping system that we have to keep track of where things are or more accurately, how things interact more fundamentally. Now, that sounds good, but there is a fly in this whole ointment, um, which is when you start doing that, you then realize that it's a bit funny, but actually every time that we do an experiment in physics, we measure space. So I might be doing an experiment in the lab on electricity, but actually all the outputs are measurements of a needle in space. We translate everything into space. When you are at CERN, you do a particle physics collider experiment, you, uh, blow things up really by having them hit each other. And then what you do is that you keep track of all the places in the space where they hit. And in fact, you also measure time by measuring space, how your clock goes around. You, you, we are always weirdly measuring space, um, which doesn't seem to be fundamental. And that gets a bit tricky. And where do you go from that? You kind of start asking somewhat different questions um, at this point of what really is fundamental, what is emergent, and how do we even tell the difference between those? And at the end of the day, well, Everybody in quantum gravity is asking the question of what is reality. But if you go in the direction of uh, concepts that we take for granted, such as space being emergent, then the question of what is reality turns into the question of how do we make reality? Because um, maybe it also matters that we are part of the experiment. <laughs> just as all experiments that we have, or, or, or all the apparatus that we construct measure space and we go through the limitations of those, um, we probably go through a number of limitations because we are ourselves an apparatus that looks at the universe and we are designed a certain way. And the concepts that we come up with might have something to do with that. And that also becomes, um, I think to look at. So in neuroscience, 
you now, the way that you understand the brain is through the predictive coding framework, where the idea is that all the time, um, you, your brain, the purpose of your brain is to make sure that your, you, your body that is, is in the right state for what is coming up next. So you are, um, you have to predict what's coming up so that you get there, which by the way, for somebody that works in space time is really interesting because it takes into account the fact that it takes time to get there. You, I, I can't, um, you can't possibly react at fast enough for the environment. And, and there are environments at several levels from what is going on inside your body, say your blood pressure or, or blood sugar to the classic one on whether a tiger is gonna eat you to the whole social environment that is a long um, timeline of reacting to what is going on in the world. So the brain predicts what might happen next and then action happens in the body and consequences. And depending on whether it got it right or not, it might learn or might not learn with a whole um, open problem about um, how does it decide what to pay attention to? And the here, you actually start seeing how things work. So what, what you actually see, what is not really quite what happens. So if I drop like my glass of water on the floor and it breaks, then the sound of it and the, the sight of it dropping comes to my senses at different times. We are doing something similar, by the way, to what we're doing in the beginning with uh, the black hole, we're just trying to keep track of the physicality of, of everything that is going on. So things arrive at different times. Um, what the brain does is actually just wait until all the information arrives, then it kind of tweaks the story like a film editor, and it gives you something that looks like the glass fell at the, the sound and the, the sight of it happen at the same time. So it synchronizes the movie, if you like. And in the process, it might also ignore a bunch of things, or it might add a few things it does actually make a story for you. And those stories presumably have a certain value. So we don't really understand how this is working. This is a binding problem in neuroscience. How do we make a story out of all the different things that are going on out there? And that is a key point here that the stories are the only things that anybody can act on just a bunch of raw data is a bunch of raw data. You can't do anything, you can't predict, you can't act. And our biology already knows that. And that happens at, at multiple levels. So your emotions, your reactions, their purpose is to, again, your emotions move the body to the right state whether that's a state of fright or a state of relaxation, whatever it is, it is moving the body. It's also memory and it's decision-making. So they're all focused to a future and they're again, all a story. So Damasio's quote that we are feeling machines that think is true. And when you consider what it means is again, stories are being told that have a purpose. And above that, there is also the meanings, our thoughts. The, the interpretation that we give to things. In fact, that's another layer that is to a great extent taught. And it comes with um, a long list of things that we ignore and a long list of things that we agree to agree on what is important and what is not important. Many things that we do not pay attention to. And now it's not difficult to start seeing 
how in those connections, the um, things like why is why are notions and concepts such as space so built into everything that we're doing might very well have to do with the physicality of our world and the way that you would normally say it in neuroscience is that our cognition is embedded embodied uh, so we are embedded in the world we are part of it and fine-tuned for that and that is a particular kind of uh, environment both physical and social that we are designed for and in a certain sense if you're doing quantum gravity you're trying to go really far away from that but it's also not possible because you always need a story in order to make a prediction and everything in science and everything in human nature is about making a prediction so maybe a place to take all of these things, because they're really lots of open questions at the end of the day, is that we are probably at that transition point where we do have a lot of data. Uh, we actually have an enormous amount of data about many, many things uh, from cosmology to neuroscience. And at the same time, we are entering regimes where things are highly interconnected. So the, the physics that I grew up with is premised on the idea that you can study a system in isolation without um, how it relates to everything else. But that is starting to break down in so many different places. <laughs> Interestingly enough, it also starts to break down in our own experience because we are connected to everybody else uh, at this point. And maybe that is about to change um, a lot of how we um, understand basic concepts and quite what you consider as real. There is a, Cormac McCarthy, McCarthy has a beautiful um, article in the in Nautilus on the Kekele problem, which is um, the story of the scientists that, um, realized that the benzene mo molecule was um, a circle. And it happened in a dream where he dreamt of a snake eating his tail. And in this story, he goes back to language and how much language by itself shapes our idea of how the world is connected and what the fundamental dynamics of the world might be. That it's the story of Helen Keller, who was a crazy case of a girl that had no functioning senses. So she was blind, she was deaf. Um, and so she could not really get the usual data from the world. Um, but she could eventually learn some signs. Um, and the, there's a play about this that has a big moment when she realizes that the sign for the water is not a, just a representation of the water, it is the water. And in some sense, that's what language does for us. It, it identifies the concept of something with the something. But that has consequences because language has a very, um, narrow structure. It has objects and subjects and verbs and they connect in a logical way. That is a sequence. And that doesn't seem to be how the world connects. The world seems to connect as a network with a lot of forward and backward feedbacks. That's what the brain does. That's what, what quantum gravity does. Actually, that's what our social world is starting to do. And then our ideas of, uh, iteration and consequences, and this implies that, start to hinge on what is even that we are looking at and how can it be that we are all seeing the same thing? There's so much happening around you right now that you don't notice. What 
is that process? How do we decide what is important and what is not important? And I will leave you with those thoughts. I think it's remarkably interesting and actually neuroscience is an amazing place to start unraveling that because there are extreme cases where you can um, start seeing what parts of our cognition is an illusion and what isn't and and also start seeing new ways to formulate what science should be doing and that the core of we still always need to predict is really tied to a story so this is a shift from if you like science of the last couple of thousand years which was aiming to describe what the world is to um, switching to describing just how to predict because how the world is has so many things embedded in it that might not be the point. So whether I used my little dots for the fundamental universe or actual particles doesn't really matter. The question is always, what is it you can predict? Um, I'm hoping for a discussion after this. I will stop sharing my slides. Thanks. Thank you, Fotini. It has been really a um, great conversation and I'm sure our audience is looking forward for this. Uh, so I want to start, I would like to encourage everybody to push their Q&A through the Q&A um, uh, uh, box and we will take it one by one. I have a question. Um, you have really built an amazing parallel between the work you're doing and the neuroscience um, activity. Would you, would you perceive this as a way of building a, a better pal parallel of uh, visualizing our reality? Because today we're talking about the conversation of the metaverse where we want to exist in a virtual reality and make sure that we have this extension of our real identities into virtual spaces. But there has been also a lot of questions about the, the um, I would say, the reliability of the technology and perceiving the human identity and not also affecting the level of human development that comes with it. So do you see what you're doing as a better alternative to building a metaverse kind of parallel than the current norm? Um, I would hope so. So, I mean, this is a big question you asked. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll say how I see this. So I have flowed over time in this space between the fundamental science and personal experience, because I think that you can't do the one without the other. They're both kind of lame if you ignore the other side. So uh, uh, the pure theoretical physics I started as tends to ignore people. We kind of always were like, oh, people mess things up. We just don't do people. And I've spent these years um, understanding the human experience because I think that that feeds into the science. At the same time, what the science um, has to say is quite a lot about um, how to look at data because Ultimately, many things that we're talking about here is how to look at data, what is unavoidable and what isn't. And I've also obviously spent quite a lot of time in the technology space and a lot of it is data driven. The, these questions about the metaverse and so on, they do have, uh, they come from a very narrow way of looking at what is it that you're delivering to people, what it is that they want, what is even possible. And the, the scientific perspective, especially complex systems, can actually bring on a much better way to understand uh, what is really going on. Perfect, so I have a follow-up to that. So what are the synergies then? And I agree with you because the current way of building the metaverse is, is, is very narrow in terms of impact, and uh, a human impact. So how can we improve that? How can we make sure that it touches different points on, for example, brain development or 
uh, or, or, or even human development, children human development, rather than just the current perspective? Um, well, let me give you an example. Um, the, so I've, one of the places I've spent time in is mental health. So, um, and in mental health, you can actually see literally the different paradigms. So in normal medicine, you can treat just a broken leg. It's a broken leg. All broken legs are the same. So yeah. you treat the broken leg and you don't care about anything else about the person. Now, the, it's not the same with mental health at all because it is the actual experience. It's tied to culture. It is tied to so many things. Now, what there is a huge push, especially in the field of digital mental health, to put everything in boxes and kind of treat uh, any discomfort somebody has as a broken leg. And mm -hmm. in the process, remove the agency from the person, remove the meaning this has for them. And that's the point. Context is a huge part of experience. And there isn't any reason not to include that in the science. So in complex systems, when you look at feedback, then you can bring in the context. And an individual has context. A broken leg is very low context. Mental health is very high context. Those things you can just do. And um, in, in digital mental health, they're ignored. And as a result, a lot of what is being built the need is massive, the intention is good, the science is bad. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense. So this is a good segue to our next question, uh, which is uh, by Ragul, and he's asking, you mentioned relativity and quantum mechanics combined together to explain the quantum gravity and mentioned how the universe uh, as such as not a local uh, uh, entity, and that's local here and there. Could you elaborate more about this perspective yeah. of locality? Um, okay, so what I'm saying is that I am not starting with uh, geometry. I'm just starting with stuff. So the universe is stuff, it's a collection of stuff. If stuff interacts, then we call it local. So it's just a name that we put on things that interact. If it doesn't interact, then we call it non-local. So then I can't really tell you in those models uh, who is doing what, but I can describe the phase that it is in. And it could be in a phase where everybody is interacting a lot with everybody else in which case you have what we call the non-local phase or the high temperature phase and has a certain behavior, which um, has similarities with what happens inside black holes or in the early universe, as you would expect. And then you have other phases that uh, things interact with very few other things in an order way. And that behaves a lot like a flat space, uh, space time. Does that? work so the uh, the idea here is that um the fundamental thing is not really matter it's pre-matter if you like uh the fundamental thing is this pre-matter and it's dynamics and uh geometry is a useful way to describe it it's um just as good as any other accounting system you might have and it's, we only came up with it because we happen to live in a very cold universe that is ridiculously ordered. Otherwise we would have never thought of using uh, space-time geometry as a good concept. And so I can see the next. Uh, so I think you touched point as well on this next question by uh, Nusrat Jafari and he's saying, so what's your definition of, for quantum gravity? Do you mean that you don't build um, uh, Wheeler-Dwight equation to, to yeah. model the system? Um, and he's asking, non-locality is very difficult subject. 
is this non-locality leads us to the nonlinear relativity, uh, such as deformed spatial uh, uh, special relativity DSRs. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's take them in order. So no, I do not have a Wheeler de Witt equation. And in fact, this started from uh, the Wheeler de Witt equation does not make sense because from the quantum perspective, so the Wheeler de Witt equation for everybody is the wave function of the universe. So you can think of a whole space time, you slice it into moments. And at each moment you have a wave function of the whole universe. Um, and then you look at how this evolves over time. Now, that is a concept that never worked really very well. And it also creates a lot of problems in quantum cosmology because there's a question of who gets to see that? Who is the observer that actually sees the whole, will, the, the, the whole wave function of the universe? So um, the point of just starting from interactions, pairwise interactions, between the constituents is that you don't need the wheeler the Witt equation. At any given point, you, you can have the standard um, quantum mechanics of the constituents, and then you glue them together into the space-time, if you like. Um, the, the question about the SR, there are some, this is not straight the SR. Uh, There are some connections. There's a lot to say about non-locality, by the way. And we, we also have a paper where we actually looked at the um, quantum mechanics itself, the uh, entanglement, the non-local entanglement as uh, coming from leftover non-local links as the universe grows. So you start from everybody super connected, it then unfolds and you have a much less connected space time, but you're gonna be left with some non-local links, just as any um, such little bits of impurities are going to be left in such a phase transition process. And um, those have a relationship with a Schrodinger equation. Maybe. So we have another question from Giancarlo Camelo, and he's asking, how does a continuum space-time geometry emerge from such discrete model of fundamental objects interacting together on a graph? Yeah, so that's a good question. It actually relates to the DSR question that was asked before. So um, now the, there are two ways to have a discrete model and they have been worked on a lot in quantum gravity. So one is that you say that there are such things as atoms of space-time, so that uh, the geometry is fundamentally discrete. Now, that is in many ways promising, but it eventually ran into problems because of Lorentz invariance. So um, that is uh, basic symmetry of space-time, but it's a non-compact group, which means that if you're boosting enough, you're going, uh, accelerating enough, you're gonna be able to see that uh, the, those atoms of space time. And right now we do have actually experimental constraints to that and it doesn't seem to be true. So, but that kind of discreteness is different than what I'm using. Um, I'm just using discreteness as a model. So you can, you can always make a continuous version of the same things that I have as you do in condensed matter physics. So the, the little stuff that I have is just a model in this case to um, track phases in a phase transition. It is, does not say anything about whether the universe fundamentally is discrete or not. So thank you so much, uh, Futini, for this amazing, insightful conversation. I'd like to end this conversation with one final positive takeaway from you. Um, but maybe after asking this final question from the audience from Li Hao Ju, and he's asking, we often experience the feeling to do or not to do. When the result comes to a reality, can these three matters quantum express 
expressed in uh, neuronal activity in the brain uh, to achieve better standpoint? Um, that's a, I mean, the feeling to, know, to do or not to do, <laughs> that's a great feeling. Um, so just to be clear, I'm not making a connection. I'm, uh, I'm not saying that there's something quantum going on in the brain. Um, just looking at the brain <coughs> and how we can construct stories of the world and concepts. Uh, I think that, that that spending some time, I think, understanding uh, how we come up with concepts is actually quite helpful on these questions of to do or not to do. Uh, because often, where let, let's say it in this simple way. We get stuck because there's a conflict. Somewhere in the calculation of what is it that we would like to do, we feel conflicted and then we feel stuck. If you look at the process that the brain runs, it's not a surprise that there are conflicts because it has to ignore so much, it has to learn, it has to adapt to an environment. You might now be in a different environment there are gonna be conflicts. There is uh, a, a, a piece of wisdom there that actually probably doesn't matter very much. Mm. It just, a lot of things are just constructs and we get quite attached to them as if they're just so true. It doesn't matter, we're all gonna die. So it's, it's that. Uh, and there is something nice actually about understanding what reality is real and what reality isn't, it's just functional. Yeah, like categorizing reality into different paradigms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Nusrat is insisting uh, on just making a final note. He's saying that they have a model for discrete geometry. You know, I love those models. I, I, I love discrete geometry. It's just that uh, it was one of the disappointing things in my life that it didn't just go through and see experimental verification as we would have liked to. It has turned out to be a lot more complicated than we hope, but I like them. I love them. Promise you tonight and now it's a, it's a final wrap. So I wanted to know <laughs> what are the challenges that you are perceiving conducting this type of interdisciplinary research, especially when you're trying to connect the complexity of nature to the very structured level of research, as you have said, a very real constructs and ideas to building something like empathical technologies and something that's very, very, very practical and very impactful to human life. What are the challenges and what are the opportunities from your perspective? Um, I think what you just said, that it's interdisciplinary and pretty much nothing is designed for that in academia, which is a problem. Um, and it's not just a, a system problem. It's also quite hard to have understanding from different disciplines. Uh, everything is very fractured. And then I've also been in this place between the academia and the market. And the market is also interesting because on the one hand, it's also super focused and in the process can be narrow and there's no room for multiple ideas. At the same time, it meets reality. And um, sometimes in academia, you can have more blinkers on, okay, I'm gonna stay in my silo and ignore the others. But reality says, I don't care. <laughs> if we need more than one ingredient, we need more than one ingredient, otherwise it doesn't work in the real world. So the, the cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, whatever you call it, I think complex systems is wonderful because it has a unified language, just as information theory has a unified language. We didn't talk about that, but part of why there is an information theory paradigm is to have a common language between disciplines. Um, yeah, but I'd say that that's a challenge and us talking more to each other. That's always the way to go. Fontini, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you. And I think it's a very positive note to end this beautiful conversation where we can have this kind of public call for a holistic and interdisciplinary collective of impact around this research in the future. Yeah.
Yeah, no, I, I agree. And good luck with all that you're doing over there. We need all of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see Thank you. Good evening, everyone.